Hey everybody, I hope you're all doing really well today. I hope it's been a really good one. I wanted to talk about California lilacs today because this is one of my absolutes. Uh, once again, dealing with the allergies, so <laughs> my apologies, you guys. Um, this over here is California lilac or Ceanothus thursiflorus. It's in the Ramnaceae family, so it's in the buckthorn family. Common name of this guy is California lilac which I find really quite interesting because it's not related to lilacs at all. Lilacs are actually in the genus Syringa, so most of the lilacs you'll see are Syringa vulgaris, which is actually a close relative of the Mediterranean olive um, in the Oleaceae family. So this is completely different. This is in the sea buckthorn family. There's about 50 to 60 species of California lilac. Not all are called California lilac, but just members of the Ceanothus family. Uh, I believe in the east they're called Jersey Tea Bush. Uh, they're also called the Plains Soap Bush uh, in the Plains, kind of in the Nebraskas. Uh, or in the Dakotas, pardon me, uh, as well as Nebraska. Uh, about 50, maybe a little bit less, more like 45 of the varieties you can find in the west. 41 to 43 of those species are native to coastal northern California and southern coastal Oregon. So you'll find them around Crescent City, you'll find them around um, Bandon, Oregon, you'll find them kind of in that area, if you're familiar, just north of San Francisco. A uh, few things that I want to say about this is, in general, they bloom in June, May and June, but you can get varieties that bloom earlier, so don't think that you have to have a plant that blooms in the summer when you grow this. Concha, for example, Skylark, Ray Hartman, there's a few different varieties in different shades of blue uh, that bloom a little bit earlier on, kind of in April. You can get different colors too. Not all of them are blue. Some of them are white. Some of them are kind of a pink mauve color. And they all have kind of similar growth habits. So this is a plant that likes it to be very, very dry in the summer. So you got to think about growing like madrones or arbutus trees. It's a very similar biome that they're native to. Uh, this is kind of a first colonizer plant after a fire event. So if you are in an area that's very prone to forest fires within its natural range, this is one of the first plants that you'll see colonize uh, disturbed lands. Um, I'm growing mine in a container here, but they're definitely more suitable for being grown in ground, just because they have a very large root system. <laughs> One thing that you might want to do routinely through the uh, season is prune out some decayed wood. This is the kind of plant that does actually shed a little bit of its older wood every once in a while. Definitely full sun, pollinated by a variety of bees. Um, it's just a really good plant. It's a fast grower once it's established. You're going to want to keep it well watered within the first year, two years, and you're going to want to keep it somewhat protected. I recommend putting reme or some sort of landscape fi fabric over top of it, just because it's a little bit more cold sensitive in its first couple of years. So this is a hybrid of Ceanothus thursiflorus called Victoria. This is very common in northern climates. Um, I'm in the lower mainland of British Columbia, so here it actually gets pretty cold in the winter, especially with the way that the climate's been shifting lately around here. So this is going to be hardy to almost negative 20 degrees Celsius. I haven't seen success with this below negative 20 Celsius, but it's definitely a warm climate plant, so it really loves it to be hot couple of the key ID features of this guy, there's three prominent veins on the backs. Most of them are very brittle. You'll find ones that are slightly less brittle though. Extremely small black seeds uh, that are born in these really small white trilobed capsules. Uh, not palatable at all, you guys. This plant is so incredibly fibrous, I would not recommend eating it. Uh, I don't know if you can see, they're actually also pollinated by ants. That guy's kind of going on town, to town on that. And the flowers have these little star kind of shapes in the middle. Really, really beautiful. Now I put the camera really far from my face, so... <laughs> Sorry if you couldn't hear that, but... Um, if you shear this back to kind of a round shape, and you cut continuously... Sorry, this isn't even focused. And you continuously cut off the lower growth, you can grow this into a really nice topiary. And my philosophy is you can grow anything in a container. It'll just be a little stunted. It'll be a little more of a bonsai 
form if you will. Another thing I really want to say about this particular plant is going back to its theme of flammability uh, and its association with forest fires in the wild. If you want to grow this by seed, it requires what's called heat stratification. So I recommend uh, collecting the seed, typically later on in the summer, closer to September into October, and dipping it in boiling water for a couple minutes first. And then they require what's called a, a cold stratification. So if you just plop those seeds into the refrigerator and you keep them in there for in excess of about eight weeks minimum, I would say, uh, you get really good germination the next year. If you don't do that, though, you get, generally speaking, really, really poor germination. Uh, I recommend mixing the seed with a bit of sand when you're sowing, too, just because they're so small. They're almost like poppy seeds. If you want to grow these from cuttings, I recommend waiting until the plant is more mature and then picking a cutting that has a little bit of old material attached to it, something a little more woody than this per se. And I recommend using a rooting hormone if you're for rooting hormones and you are okay with synthetic products because it just has better viability and it has more under differentiated cells that can create a root collar and you're just gonna get so much more success. Sorry, there's a motorcycle going by. <laughs> You're going to get so much more success if you have more mature material on your cuttings. I really do recommend taking cuttings in the fall, and then they can benefit from that winter uh, rain. Uh, what else should I say about this plant? A lot of them are very fragrant. The Victoria, for example, I think is one of the least fragrant varieties. But it definitely has a lot of staying power in the garden. If you want to prune these for a second flush of blooms, when everything's kind of finished and you're starting to get those seed pods, cut it back a few inches and you should get a second flush later on in the season, typically around September. Uh, what else should I say? These naturally don't stay true to seed, so if you, because I believe Victoria is actually a hybrid, if you plant them by seed you're going to get um, a slightly larger flower, typically a little bit less showy, and the growth habit will change too. Uh, these guys can grow into mature trees upwards of 25 feet, so if you have a lot of space and a lot of time, it takes a really long time for them to get that big, though. Um, I would say that these are deer and rabbit repellent. I haven't seen any attacks from rabbits or deers or anything of that nature. Not even that guy. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry, my allergies. Uh, what else should I say? Another ID feature of these guys is they're very pale and almost like velvety kind of on the bottom and they're very glossy on the top. All species of California lilacs, most Ramnaceae members actually have that feature. Um, another reason why this is called soapberry actually is because fishermen in the northern coast of California used to rub the buds of the flowers on their hands and it would get rid of the fishy odor that they would come home with. Uh, which is just another cool thing about this plant. Sorry, there's a truck going by. So much traffic today, you guys, it's insane. Uh, another thing that I will say is this plant has many naturally occurring uh, associations with beneficial fungi. So it is a nitrogen fixer. So if you have an area where you want to plant things around its base, and it's an area with low nitrogen, this actually does supplement some of the nitrogen levels within the garden. Just something to know. Um, Several people have advised me online that if you cut this back and you want to remove your California lilac bush, it's best to keep the root system in because it's so beneficial to the soil structure and the soil microbiota. Uh, what else should I say? This is a very diverse group. Jeez, I keep getting interrupted by the birds now. Oh my gosh. Uh, this is a very diverse group of plants. Um, if you experience a lot of this dieback like this. It could be because your winters are a little too wet. Um, just another thing to keep in mind, it likes being on the drier side. Really showy though. This plant also benefits from a little bit of blood meal later on in the season. It just kind of gives it another boost that it needs after flowering. Another thing that you might have issues with on this plant, oh it's not focused, sorry. Another issue you, you might have with this plant is aphids specifically jewel aphids. Um, they just reduce the vigor of the plant. They're a little bit of an architecture modifier. You'll get a little bit of stunting here and there. 
little application of half soap, half water kind of gets rid of those guys. Uh, yeah, I think that's kind of all I got to say about this one. Yeah, it's, it's really quite beautiful. It almost develops this kind of gray color as it grows. Super long lived, super hardy. So I hope you guys are all having a lovely day and uh, stay blessed.